Welcome back to the channel, everybody, and welcome back to another new video where today I'm going to talk about the lawsuit between seven lead plaintiffs on behalf of the 3,000 people who bought Dodge Durango Hellcats in 2021 regarding the new launch for 2023 of the Dodge Durango Hellcat. Now, I have the actual lawsuit that I'm going to show you up on the screen, but I want to get this out of the way real quick. One, there are a lot of people out there talking about this thing. And frankly, it bugs me because I watch these videos how, how I consider myself a layman. I am not a lawyer. I do not have legal, you know, formal legal training. But boy, some of the videos are just about getting views. Now, do I want the views? Hell yeah. But some of these are just like, okay, boom, let's do a video, read the article and talk about the highlights and give a very, very layman's opinion and then get a bunch of views and everybody could have just read the article. What I want to give you all is a little bit more than that, okay? I actually pulled the lawsuit. I'm going to go through the lawsuit and even though I'm not an attorney, I have a lot of experience being being on the defendant side, having been in the real estate industry at an executive level for close to, I would say, probably 15, maybe 18 years from when I used to sell houses, dealing with a periodic lawsuit once in a while, oftentimes very frivolous, but dealing with these things. And then being the PMK, the person most knowledgeable at my last company for close to about 11 of the 15 years. And it's interesting how that happened. I was a maybe, geez, 30-year-old guy, and I'm sitting in an office in uh, North Orange County, California, and the vice president of the company comes to me, and I'm a branch manager, and he says, hey, Brad, um, me and the owners had a conversation yesterday, and we think you are the perfect guy to be the PMK. I go, what the hell is that? Well, the person most knowledgeable, the person that knows more about the real estate industry, more about our company than anybody. And I was like, well, I'm very flattered, but I don't know if I want to do that. What does that entail? And he says, well, when they depose people, you'll be the guy they depose. When they um, need somebody to sit on the stand, you'll be the guy that gets yelled at by the plaintiff's attorney. Okay, cool. That does not sound fun to me. I don't want to do this. He went back and came back and said, the owners really, really think that you should be the guy for this. And at that point, I wanted to move my career forward. And they had the our company attorney call me. And he told me he thinks I would be perfect, that I would be good on the stand, and I'm quick on my toes, and I'd, I'd be the right guy to represent the company. So I said, okay. And for the next, what, 11, 12 years, I spent, and by the way, this doesn't mean we got sued a lot because we were doing bad things. Lawsuits are part of just being in California, and people will sue for anything. We got sued for a ghost, an apparition in a hallway once that took 13 months to get dismissed. It was absolutely ridiculous. But in California, yes, you can comment below again that I should get out of here. I'm not leaving my family. I'm not leaving my friends. I'm not moving out of the state. So save that comment. But things are ridiculous when it comes to lawsuits. Everybody sues for everything. Everybody either is an attorney, knows an attorney, best friends with an attorney, their kid's an attorney, their brother's an attorney, their sister's an attorney. So we deal with lawsuits. The vast majority of them go nowhere. But I can tell you I've spent a lot of time sitting on the stand, being deposed for days on end, 10, 12, 14, 20 hours, and dealing with this stuff. And I have at least a layman's, a decent layman's knowledge of some of the things that take place in an actual lawsuit, not case law. I'm not going to be quoting laws or anything like that. If I do, I'm going to read it from my screen to share with you. But I can tell you, I know how these things tend to go. I have a great experience on how these things tend to go. I could share with you some of the enormous ones where I was the guy that was sent in to sit in this gigantic mandatory settlement conference with some of the largest companies in America and watch them hash out what turned out to be multi, multiple tens and tens of millions of dollars worth of um, claims that ended up having to be decided. I've been in the depths, in the trenches. I've dealt with this stuff. And I know the ugly side of it. And I understand a lot of times the angles that people are taking in these things. So I'm going to share with you my opinions from a non-attorney, layman, just guy that loves cars and guy that spent a lot of time dealing with lawyers over the years and I went ahead and did a little research and I found the lawsuit. I pulled the actual lawsuit. So I'm going to put it up on the screen. And I'm going to go through it one line, well, line by line, but not every line. 
with the parts that I think are most interesting for you all to see and give you my opinions. Now, it's important I preface this entire video with I am not taking sides with the plaintiffs or the defendants. I am not saying this guy is right, this guy is right. I have my opinions, and sometimes it may sound like I'm taking a side, and for some of you, you may lose your mind because it sounds like I'm taking Dodge's side. I only deal with reality. That's all I'm going to talk about here. It's not about whether they're right, wrong. Do I think these people got slighted? I'll preface this video with, of course they did. But since when, in, in, in our lives as adults, did we start trusting car manufacturers and car dealerships? Like, what happened to our brains? Our whole life we talk about how they screw us over, we go to the dealerships, we get rolled, we get cheated on, you know, all this stuff happens. Yet, all of a sudden, when it comes time to buy this unique one-off limited edition car, we decide to trust the one business entity that we have never trusted in our lives. It's like we lose our minds when we believe there's an opportunity for us to gain, a hope for us to gain. If we go back to our senses and realize that we are not doing business with companies that generally are sitting around thinking about how how much can I give back the customer and instead they're thinking how much can I get out of the customer, then I think we're dealing with reality. We, we've got to use our brains here. But for some reason, people think that there's this high road that these manufacturers and these dealerships should have taken. The problem is, is when we've, from the customer perspective, have spent years and years and years grinding the prices down while they've been grinding us up, bottom line, it becomes an adversarial relationship. I'm not calling them evil, and I'm not saying that we're bad customers, but we're customers, and I'm always going to kind of root for the customer. But in this situation, I don't know that I can. I don't know if anything's going to come out of this, and I just know the reality of a big lawsuit like this. And it's not even a big lawsuit, but it's a, you know, at a big company like uh, Stellantis, this is kind of like an ankle biter. Like they knew going in, this was going to happen. They knew someone was going to file it. And they knew some plaintiff's attorney was going to make a bunch of money on his attorney's fees. They knew it was going to be a contingency lawsuit where the attorney is going to take the money if they win. And they knew that they were going to get probably get some money out of them just to make this thing go away. That's what I expect. But let's go ahead and jump into this thing. And I'll share with you just my thoughts on what is happening in this lawsuit and where I think this thing is going. So let's go ahead and pop it up on the screen. All right, so here it is, the front page of the lawsuit. And these are the people. This is public information. You don't have to do a lot of digging to find this stuff. And, and it says, on behalf of themselves and all others similarly, similarly situated. Well, that would mean all the other, you know, just under 3,000 people who bought that, Hellcat Durango, who they're hoping will jump in when it comes time to split up the money. And it's important I share with you, how do these things work? Not coming, remember, not legal advice. I'm not speaking for, as a lawyer here. You can look it up on Google, and I've seen these things go down, is the lead case plaintiffs, which these people are, end up getting the most of the money. The attorneys get a bunch of the money, and what's left gets split up amongst the other 2,890 three people or whatever it is. And it tends to be not very much money. All of you have gotten that email that um, all you have to do is click the button and this your cell phone company will send you a gift card for $12.50. And you're like, wow, I heard about that $40 million you know, settlement and all I'm getting is, is $12.50? But this is ridiculous. Well, yeah, because the lead plaintiffs got most of the money and the attorneys got another big giant chunk and the rest was split up amongst everybody who clicks that button and that's what happens so there's not generally a whole bunch of money whenever people say oh, i'm gonna file a class action lawsuit i'm like well you better be the first one in and it better be good because there ain't a lot of money in it for everybody else so let's go ahead and jump right in so this is them against fca us llc and stellantis and let's go ahead and skip the boring stuff. And I'll just read this part. It says, plaintiffs bring this class action complaint on behalf of themselves and all other persons who purchased a model MY model year 2021 Dodge Durango Hellcat class vehicles or Hellcat or vehicles thereafter, which was publicly advertised by defendants through their officers, managers, employees to be a single year run limited edition vehicle 
In doing so, defendants sought to capitalize on marketing the vehicle as a unique once-in-a-lifetime and exclusive opportunity for large vehicle SUV enthusiasts. As, as a result of defendants' hype in this regard, defendants were able to charge a premium sales price for the vehicle. In fact, defendants' statements about a limited edition run of the vehicle were false and misleading in that within a year, defendants announced that they were producing yet another model year of Hellcat vehicles, contrary to the limited edition run claims. As a result, those consumers who purchased 2021 limited edition run of the vehicle paid more than they otherwise would have alternatively if they had known that defendants were untruthful in making an affirmative misrepresentation about the limited edition run for one year of the vehicle would not have been purchased or, or they wouldn't have purchased the vehicle at all. See, and th this is this is a bunch of we wouldn't have if we if we had known this. Well, that's easy to say now. At the time, we don't know if they would have. My guess is that they still would have bought these cars. But I put here, they will likely make the point, Dodge will likely make the point, that every car was marked up back then. I mean, most cars have been marked up since probably late 2020 and definitely into 2021. You couldn't find a single car. If you did, you were considered a lucky person. And if it was a special car... Uh, like this Durango, and you got it for a sticker, you had a friend somewhere. You knew somebody somewhere that hooked you up, or you lucked out somehow. And I hate to say it, but what the hell are you doing buying a car as an investment? I'm going to say this on all of my videos. Please stop it, everybody. Don't buy new, high-production, cheap American vehicles and hope that they're going to make you a bunch of money. The days of those the, the Roadrunners and these really, really special cars are gone. And 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 that maybe not. Yeah, no, I would say they're gone. And and part of the main reason why I think we got to get this across is just look around. Look around at the young people today. They don't like cars like we like cars. They're not in love with them. Some of them are. Some of them are. But so many of them aren't. Our world has changed so much that to think that these people are going to be vying for these cars in, in in high 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 price ranges down the road. I think we're just. We're just hoping against hope. Now I hope I'm wrong, and I hope there are a bunch of young car enthusiasts watching this video saying i'm gonna be that guy i want to buy that car 10 years from now for 300 grand i don't think i don't see it happening i th i think there's gonna be so many other interesting cars coming to the world and these cars will level themselves out and while they'll still always be special nobody's going to be retiring on these cars so just please stop buying them as investments unless and if you do just know that there's risk involved, like with any investment, and certainly this would be a high, high risk investment that you have a greater chance of losing than you do of winning. And I believe that point will be made if this lawsuit ever, ever makes it to court, which I don't think it ever will because few do. Let's go up here. There was a, a point in here made that in order to get get in on purchasing this eventual collector's item Plaintiffs and class members needed to contract to purchase one of these limited edition vehicles quickly. The representation that it was limited edition single year run was a representation that there would only be a limited number of Hellcats available. So for the next few pages, of course, they get into um, all the things that Kaniska said and all the things that came out in the articles. And and I, well, I'll just say that, and I wrote this down, you can see it, you know, Beanie Babies were collector's items. Cabbage Patch dolls were collector's items. Tickle Me Elmo had people literally fighting in parking lots. I think somebody got, you know, accosted physically over a Tickle Me Elmo doll. These were going to be collector's items. People still have these things in their garages in pristine condition. And while they paid $39.95 for that thing, today it's worth $120. And they're like, man, I made 100% of my money. But give me a break. It doesn't guarantee that it's going to be worth a bunch of money. It's a crapshoot. It's a dice roll. Will it be a collection, a collector's item? Yeah, probably if you keep it in great condition, this will still be based, still be one, I believe, based on what will still be, even after this year, low numbers. But nothing guarantees value. And even though they said collector's item, it could be a beanie baby that's worth nothing, but definitely rare and definitely a collector's item. Pokemon cards, uh, you know, have gone through the moon. I've watched some stupid videos where people are paying millions of dollars for these things. And then those will go out of style too. I mean, it's just. You know, buy something. If you want to invest in something, buy something that's been proven over the over history to actually be a good investment. Next, it says the representation turned out to be a classic. 
bait and switch scheme on the part of defendants. So I put down here, wait, so they didn't have an issue or get a clue when Dodge originally promised 2000. Does everybody remember that? They originally promised 2000 would be made and then rapidly came back and said, actually, nah, just kidding. We're going to do 3000. Did anybody scream then? Maybe they did. Maybe I missed those articles. But I think Dodge showed their hand then. I think Slanta showed their hand then and said, well, yeah, we, we'll build as many as we want. We're so sure we're going to build some more that we're not going to number these things. We're going to go ahead and tell you what we believe to be true today, but that could change. And they ended up building 3,000 of these things, increasing the number. So if you bought one when you thought there were only going to be 2,000, did you pay more than when there's three? Does 3000 make it worth less money or does 6000 make it worth less money or would it have to be 10000 They're going to have to address that. And I don't know how they get that point across to a jury. That's hard. Next, uh, November. Oh, yeah, here. Check this out. Let's talk about the actual plaintiffs. So here's Stacy Phillips. Stacy Phillips paid 93500 from a Dodge dealer, Greenbrier Dodge in Southern Southern Dodge Greenbrier in the state of Virginia for approximately 93500 Based on what these things were going for back then, depending on how they were optioned, this thing was 93500 If there, there might have been a $5,000 markup on this thing, but I mean, I doubt it. But let's just say there was 5000 markup and they didn't get one fully optioned. I'm going to assume they didn't pay a markup, but ninety three five was a screaming deal. If you remember when these things came out, that was a screaming deal if you can get your hands on a brand new 2021 Hellcat Durango. And by the way, I know because my wife and I, if you've been following the channel a while, went down to order one and she drove the non-Hellcat version and just didn't like it and didn't have the seats that she wanted based on that that model wasn't going to have the, I think, seven seats or whatever that she wanted, so she didn't get it, which depressed me and a lot of you who watched the channel at the time, but we were out looking, and we were expecting it was going to be in that $90,000 range if we if we got all the options that we wanted, so I'm thinking that, you know, we've got uh, Stacy here did pretty damn good. Let's go ahead to Lawrence. Lawrence, Lawrence paid 93875 in Texas at Blue Bonnet Chrysler Dodge. Wait a minute. Let's look up a little bit. In June, looks like he ordered it for ninety six thousand eight seventy five. If I'm reading this right, and then by the time the car came in, he got it for three thousand dollars less. He ordered the car, got it for three thousand less when it showed up. Didn't pay a markup, it appears, and he got one hell of a car. And if he did pay a markup, it was minimal, but he got a good deal again, ninety three thousand. So I don't know what he's screaming about. But let's go talk about Eli. Eli got a screaming deal. Eli, I could be friends with Eli. Eli knows what he's doing. Eli went out there and wrestled with this dealership or had a friend, and, and Eli got the SUV for $89,000. Now, maybe it wasn't well-optioned, but he got a good deal, $89,000. Good for Eli. What is he mad about? Doesn't look like he paid a whole bunch more money. But then let's talk about Jason. Oh, Jason. God bless you, Jason. Jason was a little excited. Jason was wrought with FOMO. And Jason, well, he got rolled hard. So whether they, they did another run or not, Jason was screwed. 111578 Doesn't matter if they build 10,000 more of these or if they don't build any more of these things. Today, these things are going for... Eighty-five, ninety thousand dollars. Jason screwed no matter what. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jason screwed no matter what. He paid too much. The dealer is is probably still spending the commission. So plaintiff, uh, Jason, you, I understand why you're mad. I mean, you should be you should be mad whether they did this or not because you just paid too much. And by the way, how do I feel about these people? I I hate the dealers for charging markups, and I hate those who are who are willing to pay these things, um, thinking they're going to make a bunch of money on the cars. By the way, if he paid 111, he wanted to be one of the first people to have this thing. So he got what he paid for. He got to be the guy rolling in that thing before anybody else. Now let's talk about Christian. Christian bought the car, bought the Durango for 94,450. Looks like he didn't pay a markup. If he did, then it was not as well optioned. Maybe it was about 5 grand. Maybe it's 3 grand. 
Bottom line is, I don't know what he's screaming about. It looks like he did pretty good. Now let's talk about Mark. Mark, 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 Mark. Oh, Mark in Springfield, New Jersey. Oh, what I wrote here. Ouch. Mark left without his pants on. And the salesman is still spending his commission check and wearing the Rolex he got after selling that that thing to Mark. I, I don't think anybody could have stopped Mark. I think Mark was on his own. Mark must not be married or he must be like me and just go do things without asking permission or having the conversation. And Mark must be either super rich or just not very bright. And by the way, on my last video, I called some of these people dummies, and there was a wounded soldier out there. There was a wounded guy who was like, that's so mean you saying that. Toughen up, buddy. Toughen up. The world's a tough place. I want to call him a dummy. I believe he's a dummy. That's it. Did I hurt your feelings? I don't apologize. I'm sorry. It just is what it is. I'm allowed to have that opinion. You can disagree with me, but it is what it is. Maybe he, maybe it was this guy that overpaid for a car and he doesn't like being called a dummy. That's okay. It, it, words, words, uh, words don't hurt that bad. All right. Now let's talk about um, Heinz. Jeffrey. 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 He got rolled too. Um, they saw Jeffrey coming and grossed him at $101,217. Um, he fell for the whole pitch that I talk about in my other videos, which is when they say, well, this car is going to triple in value. Remember that conversation where I recorded the call from the Dodge dealer where the kid was telling me, well, if you get a Hellcat, it's going to triple in value. Meaning if I spend $90,000 on my Hellcat, that thing's going to be approaching $300,000 in a couple of years. And he's like, yes, that's what's going to happen. Well, this guy right here, he believed it. He believed it enough to go spend that money. And that, I don't know that the the that Stellantis should be responsible for that kind of reckless behavior with your money. I mean, you wanted the car and you 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 were willing to pay that money for it, knowing that cars are not generally good investments. And the risk that Dodge, Dodge already brought another thousand cars to the market, I don't know. I'm thinking, and he got what he asked for there. So so that's those folks. Now let's go down. I'm sorry to be harsh, but I just, I'm tired of the, the markups and the people that pay them and then are mad about paying them. It's like, you did it. You know, that's why I'm not doing it. If they watch my videos, I've been screaming about this for years. All right. So now let's talk about the $5 million because there's a bunch of, you know, just thumbnails out there. It says $5 million lawsuit. It's not a $5 million lawsuit. They are not filing. They are not suing for $5 million. Let me read this. The aggregate amount in controversy for all class members exceeds $5 million. That means the combined amount exceeds $5 million. It could be $20 million by the time they're all said and done. They don't have to specify the exact amount when they start the lawsuit. They have to do that later on. So check this out. They're not suing for $5 million. Because think of it like this. If the people doing the videos right now talking about $5 million simply did the math, 3,000 Durango Hellcat owners divided by $5 million is $1,500 each. Do you really think they're all fighting for $1,500 each? It would actually be less because those seven original class members in this lawsuit would get a significant amount more, leaving even less for the rest of the 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 Durango Hellcat owners. So it would probably be less than eight or nine hundred dollars by the time it gets to those people, or even less. So it's definitely not five million. It says for all class members exceeds five million, and here's why. And I'm taking this this right off the internet here, and I suspected that that number was because of some kind of minimum amount. And the Class Action Fairness Act of 2005 changed the amount and controversy requirement for determining whether diversity jurisdiction exists over class actions, meaning lawsuits where people from multiple states, plaintiffs from multiple states or defendants from multiple states are involved. It goes to the, the federal level. Over these class actions, the section explains what rule changes were made and the practical implications of those changes, including the amount in controversy requirement. The amount in controversy must exceed $5 million aggregated combined. So that's not what they're suing for. They're suing for way more than that. There's also speculation out there, which I couldn't find in here, that they would like for Dodge, which would come out in a settlement, to just halt production. I can tell you I don't see that happening. I think that, you know, bulls left the barn that they're not going to halt production. They'll make so much money on those things that it's cheaper just to settle with all these all these guys. So they want money and will they get settled? Well, maybe they will get a settlement. Will it will all these people get rich? No, absolutely not. Will 
All the Durango owners get a little tiny check, maybe, once it's settled. Or will Stellantis bury them in court for the next five to ten years and let them fight this thing out until the attorneys finally say, we just can't afford to do it anymore? So now the court has personal jurisdiction over the defendant of CA because of incorporated in this district. I wanted to make sure I put this in here. Oh, considering... Considering the 2021 Durango Hellcats are still selling close to MSRP, even with miles on them, I don't know how they'll quantify their losses. Someone will have to show where the losses were taken. And with 2,000 buyers paying thousands of varying amounts from MSRP to markups, how do they come up with the damages? How do they, if they went to trial, how do they come up with, okay, well, this is how much we lost. And do they just say, well, since you, it was fraud, well, the challenge with fraud is fraud generally means that you had to know you were doing it when you did it. And I, I I'm, my suspicion is, I think I, I talk about more down here that that they didn't um, that that they didn't plan on doing this, just like they didn't plan on going from two thousand to three thousand. So here's the deal: where they're quoting some of Kaniskas's comments, where he, of course, said it'll be a single year run. They it'll be gone after this. Well, I just put here that. No question they will say, Dodge will say, that this was not fraud or misrepresentation because at the time, they fully meant it. They didn't go into this lying to try to sucker everybody. I feel like if, if I'm a jury, that member, that I'm thinking, well, did they go and tell them all this just to juice them? And then, and then knowing they're going to come out with them again, I'm thinking they're going to be able to show that that wasn't the plan. But the plan kicked in because they'll probably blame COVID and supply chain issues and emissions challenges. And finally, their ultimate right to build any car they want without being held responsible for future values of these cars, which is frankly impossible to predict. And I'm just guessing what they might say. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but that's an issue. So since Dodge only plans to build the Durango Hellcat for six months, buyers will have to expect huge dealer markups. Well, I put here four of the seven lead plaintiffs didn't even appear to not even have been have paid markups. So interesting how they make that argument. But when most of the people didn't pay those markups. So what is what are they jumping in saying? I paid a big markup. I don't know. And then, of course, more quotes from what Kaniska said. But remember, this is the quote about the 2000. If you were still hoping to nab one of the year, one year only 2021 Dodge Durango SRT Hellcats, you're simply out of luck. Dodge announced today that the entire 2000 truck production run of Durango Hellcat is sold out. Of course, we know that they ultimately made 3000. So this proves they decided right after that, let's go ahead and make some more. Why didn't all those first 2000 people scream their heads off? They'll likely say that this was completely true at the time. They meant what they said. So that's the details, everybody. I mean, again, coming from a non-attorney, just a layman, I absolutely wanted to clear up what this is all about and just share my thoughts, my opinions. And what I love to see Stellantis have to pay some money to these people because I wouldn't have wanted to be one of those people getting burned. Yeah, probably. But at the same time, I think that these people that went and just paid too much for these, these mass-produced cars, even though that was a limited edition run kind of are asking for it, which which forces me to double down. What I've been telling you all forever is when you pay a markup, you throw the money away. You toss the money out the window. There's nothing you could do about that. It's just you have to assume it's gone. People who paid 200000 for Demons are able to get a 150 for it right now. The stickers, or the, I'm sorry, the prices just got raised. Everybody who owns a Demon right now raised the, the 2018 Demon, raised the price to two hundred thousand dollars, so they are hoping they're going to get that money out of that thing. The first one that does kills any lawsuits from that end of it too, saying, "Well, how did you lose anything?" So I will just tell you: don't pay markups. Be careful when you're out there buying these things, and don't get sucked into these things are investments. When I mentioned in one of my last videos that I might consider paying a little bit more for the new Demon One Seventy. I if I if I ever did that, which I really don't think I will, but if if I ever did that, if I ever lost my mind and did that, I would know that that I would say goodbye to that money. I would have a little funeral for that cash and say goodbye. I know I'm never going to see you again because I'm going to assume that that thing that I bought is likely not going to prepare me for retirement and sell like one of the most rare objects ever built. 
Will it hold its value if I keep it in great condition, low miles? Yeah, probably. But is it going to be an investment by definition? I really don't think so. And I know you'll argue with me on this one. I think it's going to be, no, you're going to drive it. And if you don't drive it and you just put it in the garage and save it there and it doesn't go up, you speculated. And speculating by definition means that you are good. You're, you understand it can go either way. And if it goes either way, you can't cry about it when it doesn't go your way. And if it goes up, we'll all stand on the sidelines and applaud for you making a great decision. Otherwise, go invest in something that actually will perform and will deliver a return on its investment and has some proven stability. And I, I'm not going to tell you where to go. I think you could probably figure it out. With that said, everybody, please like, subscribe, comment, give me your thoughts in the comments below. Be professional, be respectful. I know some of you get a little little excited in the comments with the ability to write something ugly and nasty without having to be held accountable for it. But I'd rather you just be professional and respectful and tell me your thoughts. And if you agree with me, cool, even better. Love those comments. And, uh, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Take care. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.